I needed a rack to hang things on, so I got some galvanized pipe, a single piece of solid wood, and some stain. In a few hours, it became a cool anything rack. First step in building this rack is to pick out some wood. Poplar and oak are good choices, just depends on what you prefer. I went with poplar on this build. Planks are three quarters of an inch thick, and I went with five and a half inches wide by six feet long. Lay out what you'll be hanging to get an idea of spacing. I needed 12 inches between pipe flanges to work out best. Once your layout is done, make a measuring stick, one 12 inches long, the other 6 inches for the edges. The stick is quicker than tape in laying out the flanges. Mark the end of your board, and then cut off the excess. Save this scrap of wood because it's going to be used throughout our build. You can leave the edge square if you prefer, but that's a little dull, so I'm going to go ahead and run a chamfer around the board to dress it up a bit. All it takes is a chamfer bit and a router. The bit has a bearing so you just need to run it along the edge of the board. The piece on the right is my scrap that I practiced on. It's now used to balance out the router. Just keep a steady hand and keep the edge of the bit up against the board and you should be fine. Check for any spots that need to be recut, like this one, and run the router back over it. Much easier than sanding over the flaw. Sanding sucks, but it's really important. We'll start off with 100 grit, go to 150, and finish up with 220. I'm going to do this by hand because it's a small piece of wood. When you sand, always try to go with the grain. 100 grit will get out all of the little imperfections in the surface. When sanding the edges in the profile, be careful not to round them over. You want them crisp. Once you're done with the 100 grit, do the exact same sanding with the 150, then the 220 grit. It'll make a big difference in the finished piece. Don't forget to take off the barcode stickers either. Make sure you sand your scrap piece the exact same way as your main piece. We're going to use it for stain testing, and if it's not sanded the same, it's not going to accept stain the same way. Once the sanding is done, it's time to clean off the dust. Using a vacuum is best. I'm going to blow this off and then use a tack cloth to wipe everything down. We're going to use a sanding sealer on this project to show you the benefits of sealing the wood before staining. This stuff is very similar to a shellac top coat. It's going to seal the wood just enough to give your stain a much smoother appearance. Using a foam brush, I'm going to apply the sealer to one half of our scrap piece. The other half, I'm going to leave bare wood. I really like this Mission Oak gel stain I got from Rockler. Any brand gel stain is going to work. It doesn't have to be gel based, it could be regular stain. Gel stain just seems to go on better and it's easier to control. I've used this stain a number of times on different projects, but I'm still going to apply it to my sample piece to make sure it gives me the look I want. One half of this board has sealer, the other half is bare wood. Let's check out the difference between the two. The sealed side has more of a translucent appearance to it. It looks less blotchy and has better consistency in the color. The unsealed side just soaks in the stain and it just doesn't appear as good as the sealed portion. Now I apply a seal coat to the main piece. I'm using Zinzer, but any shellac based sealer will work. Foam brushes are great for this because there's no cleanup. Just throw them out after you're done. One good coat is all you really need. If you like the look of natural wood, you can go ahead and stop right here. No need to apply any stain. Just use a coat of shellac, polyurethane, or varnish to give the wood a warm tone and protect it from staining. Shellac dries really quick, so an hour later I'm able to apply my stain. You could lightly sand the piece right now, especially if you had any dirt or air bubbles in the seal coat. I got lucky, there was nothing to sand out, so I get out another foam brush and start applying gel stain. I do the edges first, then I apply the stain to the main part. All you need to do is just brush it in. Get it as even as you can. That's the beauty about gel stain, it's really forgiving and super easy to apply. Five minutes later I go over the piece with a dry foam brush. All I'm doing is just some minor touch-ups, cleaning up the edges, making sure I've applied the stain evenly. You notice that I didn't wipe the stain once I applied it. Instead of flooding the wood with stain and wiping the excess, try brushing on just enough to cover the wood. With a seal coat below the stain, it adds more depth to the finished coat and makes the wood really come to life. I really like the way the stain came out, and if you're happy with the color, you can stop here. But let's say I want it a bit darker. All you do is wait 24 hours for the gel stain to fully dry and apply your second coat. As you can see, the second coat really darkens things up quite a bit. 
If you apply the second coat of gel stain before your first coat is fully dried, your brush will pull up the stain that you just laid down, so it pays to wait. Here's what our poplar looks like with two coats of gel stain. Now we have to apply a top coat. I'm going to use a spray-on polyurethane made by Rust-Oleum. When spraying on anything, you have to make sure the surface is clean. Blow or vacuum up the surface, then wipe it down with a tack cloth. Top coat will always change the look of your stain, normally for the better, but check it first on your scrap piece. Make sure you're happy with the look before proceeding. Then wipe down your workpiece again. Trust me, it can't be too clean. When spraying, keep the distance consistent throughout the entire workpiece. Follow it right off the edge. Overlap your previous pass by about one half. This will give you a nice even coat. First coat took 30 minutes to be dry to the touch, and now I apply the second coat the exact same way. The next day when the poly is completely dry, I use 400 grit sandpaper and water to wet sand my finish. This gets out any little imperfections in the surface and really smooths out the top coat. Do you really need to wet sand it? Not all the time. Depends on how smooth of a finish you want. Wet sanding the poly will take you to the next level. The next level is applying one more coat of polyurethane. This time I apply a wipe on poly as my final finish. Why a wipe on poly? It just finishes off the wood nicely. I'm using a satin wipe on poly that dries really quick and is a perfect finishing touch. The spray on poly really helps build up the top coat quickly. I used a gloss finish then and it actually made the wood look a little too fake. The wet sanding and the satin wipe on poly gives it a nice hand rubbed look. Plus it's really easy to apply. Now that our wood is finished we can assemble all of the pipe fittings. Using our marker boards, I lay out the first floor flange at 6 inches from the edge. A small combo square helps me get the pipe flange centered. Using a number 12 by 3 quarter inch wood screw, I secure the floor flange to the wood. Pre-drilling your holes is always a good idea. I use an eighth of an inch bit for the pilot hole. The most expensive part of the build is these floor flanges. I paid around $5.50 for them at Lowe's. All the other pipe fittings are under $2 each, but the flanges are pretty pricey. Using the marker board, I just installed the remaining three flanges. If you have a continuous measurement to duplicate, the easiest way to do it is by making yourself some sort of jig or measuring stick. Here's the remainder of our pipe fittings. Grab a 1 half inch galvanized elbow, screw it to a half inch by 4 inch nipple, attach a 1 half by 1 half inch nipple to the other end, and the last piece is a half inch cap. Screw that all to your pipe flange. Now we're ready to mount it to the wall. I use a number eight by two and a half inch drywall screw for that. Best place to put the screws is behind the floor flange. Drill a 3 16 hole for your screws. Three screws should be plenty to hold this rack in place. Make sure you hit a stud or use a hollow wall anchor to secure it. And that's it. You've got a cool rack for anything you need to hang, custom made for your needs. Just in case you need a material list for the pipe fittings, here's another look at it. 